It's the Blues Rock Show with Pete Francis and Willie Witten. Welcome to the Blues Rock Show. I'm Pete Francis, joined by Willie Witten. Today, our guest is musician, screenwriter, author John Fusco. He's written a lot of films that you probably know. Recently, The Highwaymen, which was on Netflix, Hidalgo, Young Guns, and of course, the blues cult classic Crossroads. John, thanks so much for coming on the show today. Hey, thanks, Pete. Good, Willie. Good to be here. So, John, you got into the blues at a fairly young age, and you have a really interesting story of how you kind of got into the blues. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. You know, I, um, I had started, uh, my, my first love art creatively was filmmaking, writing and filmmaking at a very early age, like 10 years old. And um, I was, uh, I would write scripts and shoot these little super eight movies, you know, that, that, that wonderful format of eight millimeter, which was, you know, before your guys time is said, uh, but uh, that was the, the first love and I, I couldn't find a, an outlet for it is growing up in a, in a small working class community. And I was like, I want to make movies. And it was like, yeah, keep dreaming. And I, I kept that dream going into my early teens. And when I couldn't find a creative outlet for it, I channeled that uh, drive into writing lyrics for local garage bands. And that became a creative release because I was all about the writing, the storytelling. And so I'd go hang out with these garage bands and they'd have their, you know, three chord specials. And I'd say, try these. And in most cases, none of these guys wanted to sing. And so I said, well, I'll, I'll give it a shot. And so I was singing my own lyrics to their music and they were like, hey, man, we, we love it. And so I ended up getting into local music scene and um, uh, actually had some success with that, uh, playing on the New Haven uh, rock and roll circuit, blues rock circuit. And um, it, it became a real passion and love. Um, I had a, a, a Hammond uh, organ, a T200 in the house with a built-in Leslie system growing up and taught myself to play that instrument. My dad was hoping I'd play in Italian wedding bands. I had other ideas. And my dad and I would often tussle over the Hammond organ. He'd find it missing. It's like, ready, take it. You don't take that out of the house. It's furniture. That led to me leaving home, dropping out of school, leaving home and heading down south. And I had this idealistic, <clears throat> romantic vision of searching out the old blues masters who um, were underneath the music of the almonds and the stones and I wanted to I wanted to dig down deeply into that. And John, so you were 16 I, at the time? Yes. Yeah, 16. So I left home, I traveled to Florida and um, I, uh, I started I started off by going to the rec bar where the Almond Brothers started and I just wanted to see Mecca, <laughs> touch, touch the magic dust <laughs> and um, and then from there I ended up going into the Mississippi Delta and working in sawmills and um, hooked up with a group of migrant workers who were the last of the real hobo generation who would ride trains. Um, strangely enough, they would go from car wash to car wash and work in car washes. So I traveled with a really interesting group of characters um, and quite a few bluesmen in that, that group. And from there, I wound up in, uh, in New Orleans and so um, it was really, it became a kind of a, a soul searching musical odyssey at a young age. And I did that up until I was um, 20, 21. I came back, came back up north a few times. I went back and forth quite a bit. And then I put a band together. I would go back to some of those early garage bands and I'd say, hey, look at this stuff I wrote. And this is what I learned from these old guys. And so we were doing pretty good with the band um, out on the blues rock scene and a, a Southern group from Virginia um, <clears throat> who had the, uh, today would be the politically incorrect name of the Dixie Road Ducks, um, asked me to go on the road with them. And so I went on a bona fide Southern States tour and did that um, for a while. And then on that, on that, uh, that journey, doing this road trip, I had this epiphany um, I, I always say it kind of cured me of my road ambitions. <laughs> and 
Um, I had I did some soul searching on that trip and decided I was going to go back to filmmaking and find an outlet no matter what it took. Um, and because I had a satchel full of stories from the road, I got into the NYU film school, into the dramatic writing program. And one of my first uh, projects I wrote there was Crossroads <clears throat> based on my, my uh, peripatetic blues journey. And it got a lot of attention, won a national award and Columbia Pictures bought it while I was still uh, an undergrad. So that's, that's the, the sort of long and winding road that, that went you know, full circle from film to music to film. And now at this, in this third act of my career, it's gone full circle again, back to music. And now I'm bringing the two together. So speaking into the music realm of making that full circle complete, uh, you've done a lot of work and, and it seems like throughout your work, uh, you go back to some of the people that you once played with. I know the Dickinson family uh, yeah. is, is a touchstone for you. You did a lot of work, I believe, on the Hill Country Review, their third album, HCR3. And now you're doing a couple albums by yourself, or I should say you're leading the charge on these albums with other musicians, the Crossroad Riders. Yeah. Give us a little bit on, on not just this, this latest album, John the Revelator, but both the albums. When you put the band together, what were you thinking of setting out to do? How did you pick the musicians? And can you talk a little about how John the Revelator is a little bit different in production terms from your self-titled one? Sure. Um, you know, it, uh, <clears throat> it, all, uh, it all kind of traced back to, to my movie Crossroads. So all that experience I had early on, you know, uh, hunting down these, these old blues guys that led to this screenplay in the movie, um, then uh, kind of put me in touch with the generation of rock guitarists and blues guitarists and harmonica players who got turned on by the movie Crossroads. And they tracked me down over the years. I mean, it, it, ranging from Devin Allman to Eric Krasno. Um, I mean, the, 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 the list, list goes on with, with, and I'm just so moved by, by how many uh, great players out there right now um, call me and tell me that Crossroads lit the fuse for them and made them pick up the guitar. And uh, uh, a couple of those guys were Luther and Cody Dickinson, whose dad, Jim Dickinson, who is a legendary music producer, musician, ethnomusicologist, the founder of Zebra Ranch Recording Studios, uh, I, I know a lot of musician friends who call him an American holy man because he was just like <laughs> um, a mystic uh, in the world of, of roots music and, um, and, and uh, hill country blues. Jim was my blues lore advisor on Crossroads. And that, that came about because Ry Cooter, who did our score, and keep in mind, you have Ry Cooter doing the score. I'm 24 years old, my head spinning. I'm like, holy, you know, we've got Sonny. He brought Sonny Terry in, who was one of my inspirations for creating that character. But now I had Jim Dickinson advising me whenever I wanted to go deeper with, with something. And Jim at that time had two young sons, Luther and Cody, who were into punk rock, <laughs> much to Jim's dismay. And Jim took them to see a rough cut of Crossroads when we got it assembled. And um, the, the boys had walked in aspiring punk rockers and walked out aspiring blues musicians. And they said, you know, dad, you're right. The blues is cool. And so they, uh, Luther and Cody have always told me, you know, hey man, you know, you turned us on, you know, it was Crossroads that got us into the blues and onward they went to form the, you know, the Grammy nominated North Mississippi All-Stars. So I've stayed in touch with those guys. And when I was shooting the Highwaymen in New Orleans, which brought me back to the Big Easy. Uh, Cody called me and said, man, you're just across the Delta. When you rap, come, come on over and hang out. Let's tell stories about my dad because Jim had passed away and they loved hearing my stories about him. And so I did just that. I rented a car and drove from New Orleans to Memphis. And that trip itself in a rented car um, became a really pivotal reconnecting with my background. I, mean, I was driving through a lot of the old areas I used to hitchhike through. And that's why we, if, you, if you listen to the, the debut album, there's a lot of lines in there about hitchhiking ghosts 
along this road and going back to the crossroads and taking the turn I didn't take and, and all that. Um, so I went to Memphis, headed into North Mississippi, hung out with Cody, and we ended up in the studio. I sat down at the Hammond organ, started playing some stuff. He jumped on the drums and then he was like, what, what was that? And I said, oh, it's something I've been, been writing because I keep, keep the writing stuff going. He's like, man, let's do it again. Then he's like, I want to record this. That happened with three or four tunes. And then, I mean, and it was exciting because Cody reminded me so much of his dad. He was sort of like catch lightning in a bottle, throw it at the wall, you know. Um, and there, there were moments in there where I remember saying, you know what I hear on this? I hear like gospel background chorus. It's like, oh, dude, dude, and he got his cell phone. And he gets Reese Norman to come in from Memphis and she lays down tracks and it just became this exciting jam session. And he invited me to stay for a week and record as much as I wanted to. And I said, man, what a great way to wrap a movie and reconnect back here with music and record with North Mississippi All-Stars guys. The next thing I knew really is that um, Cody sent me uh, his mixes and said, this is releasable stuff, man. I wanna, I wanna release this on my checkerboard lounge recordings. <laughs> okay. And so, um, we finished up some stuff with some musicians up here, up north. And I brought them in to a local studio and we laid down some sax and some blues harp for Mark Lavoy, who was a Sonny Terry protege. And so Cody at that point said, so hey, so what are we called? Like, you know, and I said, well, it's all about the crossroads, right? About you guys who, who got into this with the crossroads. I think it's, we're the crossroad riders and we did it with the X road, you know? Um, and the, the album came out and was, was met with really encouraging feedback. Um, it just, to be honest, it really blew me away and, uh, to get that kind of reception after being out of music for so long. And that was inspiring. So I just, I really cranked up the writing again, started playing, writing, and um, I got more originals together, let Cody know. And he said, come on back down, man, let's, let's, let's lay it down. So I went back down with, with new material. We recorded that. And then when I came back up here and we were doing the same finishing off with local musicians, the tap had been open and I just kept writing and writing. So I started recording stuff up here and I realized, okay, we've got a Northern chapter, Southern chapter thing going. And um, I had 20 tunes recorded at that point. And I said, Cody, so what do we do? Do we break it up? Do we say, listen, you recorded this all in one zone, one, one place where you were creatively on this, put it all on there. And that, that became John the Revelator. And to answer your question, Willie, it's a, there's you know, a lot of the raw, high octane, spontaneous stuff recorded in Mississippi. And then up North, we got into to some more uh, songwriterly ballad type stuff. Some stuff that's still with a blues and gospel heart, but um, uh, George Pettit, uh, who's a, a renowned jazz guitarist and recording engineer and producer from New York City, um, handled the stuff up here on this side. And he'd send back and for forth with Cody. And we did what people do these days, remote recording and putting it all together. But we did that album uh, and uh, we had a release on that and it did equally well. Um, it was a fundraising album because COVID broke out right at that time. And so I designated all sales uh, receipts to go to the Blues Foundation to the uh, COVID Relief Arts Fund. And it's been a, gr a great experience. John, I want to ask you about the title track, John the Revelator. What yeah. made you want to tackle that song? And the production on that song really sounds great. It just sounds huge. Yeah, thank you. You know, you know and... Uh, uh, that that approach to the sound, um, you know, I, I, that's that you know George Pettit. He's just got a, a a great ear, and he picked up on something in, in my songs that he calls cinematic. And he said, you know, this is like let's give it that cinematic, epic quality and push it into new places and bring in some sun house, you know, doing call and response. And, and um, for me, John the Revelator is significant because it's one of those tunes that I first heard when I was on that trip at 16 years old. 
traveling in these, these hobo jungles. And I'm also uh, in some of the gospel churches that a lot of these old guys pointed me to. And, you know, it's, you know, a pre-war acoustic song that's really important in the blues canon. And it's been recorded by, you know, Blind Willie and, uh, and Sun House and, um, so, you know, so many people over the years. But because it had this significance to me, when I started playing out, doing some live shows out again very recently, all within the last two years, um, and we got five sold out shows in before COVID, <laughs> I always, always started the set with John the Revelator. And I told the band that this is like the opening uh, incantation before a ceremony. Mm -hmm. and if we're going to come out, we're representing the blues and we're representing this music that's sacred to us. This is that opening sermon that calls in you know, the ghosts and calls in the, 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 the spirits um, of the blues. And so it always, it was always that warming up sermon and, and to create that atmosphere. So when we did the, the album, um, I wanted to do a cover because on the first one, we, we had one cover. It was all nine originals and one cover, and that was Crossroad Blues, um, which, which we did in, in a, a unique way, I think, because I brought in Al Capone, one of the, the pioneers of Memphis rap, to do a freestyle in it. And then I had you know, Reese Norman and gospel singers and stuff like that. But so the, the cover I wanted on this was, was John the Revelator. We made it the opening tune. And I know for some people it was kind of like um, uh, disorienting, even disconcerting to some. Like, what is this? What is this? <laughs> what am I getting into here? And, and actually we'd have that reaction we played live too. We're like, are we in a revival tent? <laughs> <laughs> I, I felt I, like it really just set the tone for the album. I, uh, I loved it. I thought it was- That's uh, cool. Yeah. I did too. I appreciate that. Yeah. So we're still, I, you know, this wasn't the plan, but this is very, we're talking stuff that is centered around the heart of the blues. And there is the Robert Johnson story, yeah. apocryphal as it may be, of the crossroads. That was one of your original screenplays. I should say it's all our original screenplays. It's one of your first. Mm -hmm. And Pete and I were just throwing yeah. the ball back and forth and thinking, you know, it's been a while. And if that movie was brought in today to do somewhat just on a thought experiment, a hypothetical remake. In mm -hmm. the original, Steve Vai is the man who is the devil's right-hand man. Mm -hmm. Plays Jack Butler. Yep, Jack Butler. Who's today's Jack Butler? In your mind, John, who would that be? Or who are some of the characters who might be a good Jack Butler? Well, you know, it's a, it's a really good question, guys. And um, I think that if we were to reimagine it today, um, I'd have to go back to my very original script, which um, I'm, I'm, I'm really, proud and honored to say is in the blues archives at the University of Mississippi. And um, I bring that up because one of the curators there read it and was very surprised about how different from the, the, the movie it was. Um, I mean, at its core, it's this relationship story. And, um, but there was, uh, tonally, it was quite a bit different. I always, I, I really strived for a dual reality you know, there was not a, the sky didn't open up and you weren't transformed to a metaphysical plane for this duel. It was, you know, Willie Brown took him to an old railhead in Clarksdale for cutting heads. And it was sort of an underground, like a fight club with blues men. And they'd have cutting head uh, cook-offs, you know? And, um, and so it was all approached from a dual reality. Like, is this just like a cut in heads or is that to Willie Brown, it was the devil. We got it, we've got to beat him. Um, we actually had Shuggy Otis um, in the, in the first, first cut. Um, and then we, we cut him because he was African-American and we had him being beaten by Lightning Boy. And then Lightning Boy takes out Steve Vai, who's a white guy. I think that you know, all of all of us uh, non-African American blues musicians owe a massive debt of gratitude, you know, to to uh, uh, the black blues and where this comes from. And so I think that in the first and foremost in reimagining 
we'd have to really go back to my to my first script, which really honored that more. And I think that would that would be essential. Um, and uh, who knows what the outcome would be uh, yeah, in that? Or maybe the lightning boy is African American. You know, but I think we we have to really really dig down deep into that and look at what that equation would be and, and how it would play out. But yeah, you know, we've got Gary Clark Jr. and Kingfish, you know. I could definitely see Kingfish in, in a Crossroads reboot. Yeah, yeah. Get Kingfish on the road. And, uh, and, I, and I think that's the, I think that's, that's how, that would be the, the right twist on it. And um, although, hey, Ralph is having great success with Cobra Kai. <laughs> that's a great show that's one of my favorite shows right now uh, you know i'm so happy for that kid i still call him a kid um he worked so hard on his guitar stuff his blue stuff and he he just he really had such a love for it and he he went on that journey of the making of the film with me and where we had this this dream job of driving around with Ry cooter and juke logan and arlen roth and heading into the, the last of the authentic juke joints across swamps and fish fries. And we were, we were, I was, you know, doing what I had done when I wrote the movie. We were like going to look for these obscure guys who might've been missed, interviewing, asking. So it was kind of like an Alan Lomax type of situation. And um, all roads led to a guy named Frank Otis Frost. Uh, Frank Frost and the Juke Joint Jumpers who appear in that film and we found them in a little juke house. Um, and so Ralph was a part of that and, and did great. But yeah, now you got me excited about thinking about rebooting it that way. Let's talk about the guitar duel a little bit more. Before yeah. this interview, I went back and watched it on YouTube. That guitar duel video has 33 million views on YouTube. <laughs> John, what does it mean to you when you see the impact that that scene still has on people? You know, I, I just, I love, despite the fact that it's different from the script and that I felt that my, my take was a little more purist as, as a blues musician. Um, the fact that it's become a, a cult film and that is beloved by, by, most blues aficionados and um and the and as i said it it kind of uh, introduced a lot a new generation of musicians to the blues and um i think that that duel uh, being so popular when you bring it up when you bring up the movie people are like oh yeah the duel with the, the duel with the devil and you know and jack butler and how about cutting heads and and um, a lot of players out there know that duel now and and um that it's just, it's incredibly, incredibly meaningful. I, I was asked recently um, during a, a film uh, magazine interview about the Western stuff I've done and um, like Young Guns and Hidalgo and the Highway Men even. And they said, so what is your, out of everything you've written, what's, what's your personal favorite gunfight that you wrote? And I said, the duel in Crossroads. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, um, and that's something that I, I think that Walter Hill, who directed the movie, and who I, I bumped heads with quite a bit on that, but as I, I was 24 and just off the road, and he was a legendary Sam Peckinpah type director who knew his Western motif and, and the machismo. And um, he was very key in calibrating that duel and bringing out the tension like a gunfight. So looking forward, John, because as you've stated, writing, film writing, the storytelling is your first love. That also has a little bit to do with music. You have, you're coming off the back of two pretty successful albums from all the accolades that they've been given and the high praise they've been given. Are you going to keep going with Crossroad Riders? Is that going to be your focus? Or are you going to drift back into writing for film or are you going to be doing your own pursuits up on your farm in Vermont? What's next for you, John? Well, you know, I think it's, it's all come together in a really uh, intriguing and rewarding way for me because, um, you know, I, I'm continuing to record. I, I've never been busier with movies and TV work. 
I have a new movie coming out this year called The Wind and the Reckoning, which we shot in Hawaii during COVID with Jason Scott Lee. And um, it's a powerful indigenous people story, uh, true story. And I think we'll be premiering at the Toronto Film Festival. Um, so, you know, the films are coming out. I have a few series I'm working on. I started recording my third album uh, last week. And um, that's going to be more in a solo vein. Um, I'm going to be bringing in different uh, musicians, but it won't be Crossroad Writers. Okay. And um, one of the things I'm, I'm, I'm really building on is that the, the two albums I released um, got some attention for being cinematic and um, telling stories and almost having an overarching narrative arc and um, so the next one I'm doing really leans into that. And I have recurring characters. I have, have the sort of the big theme that resonates in a kind of mythic landscape. It's almost, I'm looking at this album as a TV series and each song is an episode with a cliffhanger. And so while I'm exploring that now, that's sort of fueling my approach to my filmmaking. And I'm starting to really dig into uh, um, musical dramas and, and writing movie musicals in earnest within our beloved roots uh, milieu. So um, I've, got some, I've got one big movie musical right now that I'm just in the home. In fact, I'm just about to write the end today. And it's just, it's been a joy. It's been a joy to bring it together because you know, I'm writing lyrics into the script. And then I get up and sit at my piano. I say, this will be this new musical number here. And um, um, if I didn't have the albums behind me and I turned that thing in, it would be like, okay, we're bringing in Rodgers and Hammerstein or what, you know, <laughs> we're bringing in these people, but now I'm gonna dig my heels in and say, hey, guess what? Here's the script, here's the demo. Um, I've written a bunch of tunes for this that I want to at least consider. And uh, so it's kind of bringing those, all those, those things together. And now I have a, a fourth album on the books planned. So You're I've got a busy this, guy, John. <laughs> listen, you've got you to get it now. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the reason I bring this up, because my friend Cody is going to be listening down in North Mississippi. And the fourth album, in, I'm heading back to Mississippi. And it will be Crossroad Riders. And it will be a lot of special guests. Um, from from the blues world and it's going to be recorded at zebra ranch jim dickinson's place in in north mississippi it's going to be a shootout it's going to it's going to be a blues kicker so we, we've got that one on the books john nice. talking about combining music with film do you have any like passion project that you really want to make or that you would like to see made that combines music with film um, yeah, I and mean, I have to say it's it's the thing I'm working on now um, that I, that I can't really really talk about. You know, <laughs> then there are a few few bios of characters out there who I feel deserve deserve their bio. You know, I um, did you ever read uh, Peter Gorelnik's uh, Last Train to Memphis? I have not. I didn't, but was he also almost grown? Almost grown. Was that another uh, one of his books? It may have been, but I, I didn't read Last Train to Memphis. And that's about Elvis. Is that correct? It's, yeah, it's the definitive. Uh, he wrote two books on Elvis, Last Train to Memphis and Careless Love. He also wrote, uh, oh, uh, Sweet Soul Music. And, you know, he, he's just a chronicler of, of roots music and, and incredible. But I adapted his book, Last Train to Memphis. And Mick Jagger signed on as producer. So I got to hang out with, with Sir Mick and, and went on the road um, on the 50 and counting tour and worked with Mick closely on the script. And we got it right to the five yard line. And what, what stalled was just trying to cast 18 year old Elvis <laughs> because he's just so, so known. Um, so that, you know, it, it's the script's still there. That's one I would love to see happen because it's just Elvis, 1954 to 56. There's no Las Vegas sequins. You know, it's, this is the, this, the, the story of that one night in Memphis when rock and roll was born. 
It's about Sam Phillips. It's about, you know, bringing all the, these, these influences together across Beale Street <clears throat> and, um, and really uh, creating rock and roll. Uh, I also um, spent some time with Merle Haggard uh, and um, had been working with Merle on doing his story when he passed away. Uh, and there, you know, there are other uh, musical heroes out there that I, I'd love to take on. Well, that's really awesome, John. We got to thank you so much for coming on the show today. This has been great stuff. You've got great stories to tell. Anything you want to add before we let you go? Well, you know, when you asked about the duel at the crossroads, something popped into my mind that, that people are always surprised to hear. Um, and that is when we were casting the role of Jack Butler, you know, Rye had called me and he said, okay, so the script has gone out. I got it out to different guitar players and here's who wants to do the role. Jimmy Page, <laughs> Keith Richards. Never heard of him. Johnny Winter <laughs> and Frank Zappa. Pretty much everybody. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So, but, but yeah, but those were the guys that were on the short list. And then he said, Steve Vai. And I was like, and Steve Vai was like, to me, that was like, well, he's the, the least known of the meeting. Amazing. But we could have Johnny Winter up there you know, with his tattoos, his, you know, <laughs> the devil's right hand man. And they all came in, they all met and my head was spinning. I was just like, man, how, you can't lose here. But Rye, Rye wisely um, pushed for Steve. And he said, because Steve, he's killer. He's just, he's, he's a shredder and he's got a diabolical quality, you know, <laughs> physically and in his sound when he plays, he can like channel some, some uh, supernatural stuff. Um, and he's not so recognizable that you don't say, oh, I'm watching Jimmy Page. Right. I'm watching Frank Zappa. So it was the right, right choice. But um, that's always, that always tends to, to surprise people. And then they sit back and they go, let me imagine it with, with, uh, with Keith Richards. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it's been a, a real pleasure to visit with you guys, Pete and Willie. Thanks for keeping the blues alive. Thank you, John. This is absolutely great. wonderful. And, and if you guys have any comments, let us know who you think should be recast if they recast the movie today. Who would you like to see play Jack Butler? Let us know down in the comments section below. But that's going to wrap up this week's edition of the Blues Rock Show for John Fusco and Willie Witten. I'm Pete Francis. We'll see you next time.